Hey, good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing? I figured, you know, it could be a little bit more peppier. You guys had at least a little bit more sleep than the other, you know, service. You guys doing all right? Yeah, yeah all right. Just a little bit better. All right. Good, good, good. Hey, we've been in the series called No Place Like Home, which is really, it's not so much about uh, parenting or marriage, even though it has a little bit of a component to that. Really what this series is all about is about influence. It's about the reality that, um, that the most influential organization created by God is the family. And what we're trying to do is to remind us of that. And through reminding us of that, one, it helps us to understand why we do what we do and some of our own hurts and our own brokenness because family is really powerful in our lives. Also, though, to inspire us to be able to leverage this amazing thing called the family to go and influence um, the people who are in our family. So kind of do both of those things. And, and one of the things I love about uh, Jacqueline and Mike Cross is, is they do that within their own family. Uh, they are amazing, sweet grandparents, parents, children, aunts, uncles, whatever. They are just wonderful people. One of the things that, that you know, you didn't see in that story is that Mike uh, was born in Jamaica. They moved to the inner city in New York, lived a, a, you know, an impoverished life there. But through his hard work and all that, he went to the Air Force Academy where he met his wife, Jacqueline, at the Air Force Academy. And he was a co-pilot of an F-4 fighter for many years and um, has gone on to, to lead a really, uh, really well done uh, civilian life and what he does now. But one of the things is that you look at these two couples um, that they don't, they're not, you, you won't know that until you draw it out of them because those things aren't necessarily the most important things in their life. They have, a, they have kids, they have a son who is a professor, is like a PhD in physics. They have another daughter who, who procures like millions of dollars of worth of, um, you know, um, you know, investments on, on a government level in Washington, D.C. And you still would never know that unless you kind of pry into their lives because really they are the real deal and that they just love Jesus Christ very, very much. They're just humble, wonderful people who love their family and the Lord. Jacqueline does an amazing things, amazing things in um, Transformation Village down in Bithlow and is encouraging so many people over there in, the, in that community, which is really, really cool. All right, so family. Family is, is you know, is important. And um, we see that, that God has made this thing influential. And we know that moms and dads have a big, huge impact in the lives of children. But what I want us to talk about a little bit today is I want to talk about, well, who had then has the, who has the most influence in the lives of kids outside of moms and dads. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start off just kind of playing a little bit of a quasi game. How many of you guys have played uh, Family Feud before? They had to play Family Feud a little bit. So we're going to do a little bit of Family Feud here. And I'm going to give you a question. It was a question that was asked by a research firm called Barna. And what they did was they asked um, uh, a whole bunch of teenagers across the country uh, who they said, now this is who the teenagers say, um, you know, what person in their life has the most influence in when they think about their future, who has the most influence into the future if we are to take out mom and dad, besides mom and dad, who would that be? Now, if you're a parent, you may be thinking, okay, um, I have teenagers, they don't listen to me, um, and so they, you know, they listen to friends, right? So friends probably have the greatest influence in their lives, especially when you think about the trajectory of their lives into the future. How many of you guys would kind of say that would probably be kind of the case, all right? Let's see how that is. Survey said, there you go. So number three, 9% say friends have the biggest influence in their life when thinking about their future. Well, you say, wait a minute. Okay, so it's not friends. Then surely it must be us pastors, us pastors must have the greatest influence in the lives of your children. It must be us. Well, let's see. Survey said, uh, we're fourth on that list. Kind of hurts my feelings. 6% say that it's 
um, pastors. Now we kind of joke about that a little bit, but you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, if it's not, if it's, if it's not mom and dad, then friends and pastors, then I bet it has to be teachers or coaches, okay? So let's see how teachers and coaches do. Survey said, oh, that's number two. Not bad, 11% would say teachers and coaches have the biggest profound impact in their lives. And we, you know, they surveyed other, you know, there was other answers to that. For instance, some people would say, well, it must be, you know, sports heroes. Survey said, sports hero gives us 5%. And along that same lines, if you're not a sports person, maybe you're into singing, acting, and that sort of stuff. So you look and idolize, you know, uh, somebody in that, you know, in that space. And so entertainers, survey said, 6%. And so I'm tied with a bunch of entertainers with the influence of your kids. And so, wait a minute. You know, we all think about, as parents, we all want our kids to learn, and we all want them to read, and we want them to be amazing readers. And so let's see how authors do. Survey said, yeah, 1%. Not much there with that. And then um, the one I thought was pretty interesting was this one, was the, uh, the one, the second from the last, which is, survey said... Oh, politicians. Good for our kids. Look at that. We're raising great kids, 4%. Uh, so what is it then? If it's none of these things, what is, who, is, who has the greatest influence in the lives of our teenagers when it comes to the trajectory of their future? You ready? Survey said? Grandparents. Absolutely. It's family. It's extended family. That's right. It's siblings, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all of that. And look at that. It's not even close. It's not even close. You take out mom and dad on that, family still has a huge influence in our lives. And we have still a huge influence in the lives of the people who are in our family. Now, when we look through scripture, we see scripture speak into this quite a bit. Um, here, this was a, basically a 21st century research thing. But we go back 2,000 years ago and you see a lot of it were really the same. You know, we, we may have technology where we may feel more isolated, where we can kind of do our own thing. We're on, you know, we may be a, a mobile society, so we're not near our extended family as much. But our extended family, even so, has huge influence in our lives. And it's always been that way. We're going to look at a guy um, um, in, that, that lived 2,000 years ago who had an extended family that, you know, was influential, or at least someone in his life that was influential in his life. Um, he is a guy that, um, you know, a lot of you at least have heard of his name. Um, there's two books of the New Testament that are, are named after him. He didn't write them, but they were written to him, and so we kind of learn a little bit about him. He's also mentioned in the book of Acts, which is just really kind of the, uh, a, a book on early church history, if you will. Well, that guy's name is Timothy, all right? So one of the things we learn about Timothy is how extended family has influenced him. So if you have your Bible, why don't you flip over to 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 5. And so beginning with verse 3, a couple of things that's really important to understand with this, just kind of give you a little bit of context here. This letter, this is a letter that, you're, that we're, we're reading a portion of a letter that was written by a guy named Paul to this guy, Timothy. Paul was an older guy. This is uh, who mentored this guy named Timothy. Second Timothy is Paul's last letter, okay? Paul wrote a lot of other letters that we have. We call it Galatians and Romans and Ephesians and Colossians, and he, you know, and so he wrote those. He also wrote these two to this guy, Timothy, kind of his apprentice. He's mentoring this guy. So if you ever think about what in the world would somebody like a Paul, what would he say to a, an apprentice that maybe be the, be the last time that he gets to talk to him because this is right near the, the end of, uh, of his life, what would he say to them? Well, this is, this is 2 Timothy. So you kind of get a window into to what Paul would say to somebody that he's mentoring if it was kind of the last words to him. So he says this to Timothy. Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. All right, pause there for a second. Just as my ancestors did. What's an ancestor? It's a family member who lived before you. So what you see all throughout Scripture is the, the power and the influence of family and family who have gone before us. And this is what Paul is saying. There was family members in my life who went before me, called my ancestors here. 
Now, how many of you guys have ever read uh, First Chronicles? Anybody ever read First Chronicles? Anybody ever actually read word for word First Chronicles? Okay, this is a little bit different. I mean, some of you have probably skimmed some of First Chronicles. You know why? Because nine chapters, nine chapters of First Chronicles is genealogy. It's a bunch of names where, you, and, and if you read through, do you, you know, read through every single um, name, it would sound something like this. The descendants of Adam were Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. The sons of Noah were Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. The descendants of Jepheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, to Tubal, Meshech, and Teras. The descendants of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Ripheth, and Togamorah. The descendants of Javan were uh, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Rodanim. And I only did seven verses, guys. <laughs> that goes on and on and on and on and on <laughs> and on. All right? I, had to, I remember the time when I had a dialogue with God. Like, God, why is this in the Bible? If this is the ins your inspired word that is important to us, why did you give this to us? You know, my, my, my second question to that was, was it to teach us perseverance? Because this is a beating. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. It's because family matters. Family matters. These are, these are people. These are, these are grandparents, great-grandparents, children, grandchildren, aunts, uncles, and all of them have profound influence. Family has mass influence. So when I read through it again, it's a little bit different. Now I read through it like these were real people, and these were their kids that they loved, and these were people who were passing down their influence to that next generation. Some good, some bad, but it was a massive amount of influence in that. And so what we see throughout Scripture is that that family, extended family, has great influence. And so, as Timothy said, or Paul said to Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers, Timothy. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. There's an amazing bond between these two guys, this mentor and his, his apprentice. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. And then he says something really interesting here. He says, I remember your genuine faith. Man, you have an amazing, beautiful faith, Timothy. And then he, let me tell you what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, for you share the faith that was first in me that I passed down to you, my apprentice. No, it seems here that Paul is saying that this influence in his life came, you know, in a different place. Not just him, but more importantly, he says, for you share the faith that what? First filled your grandmother Lois. The power of influence in an extended family. And your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues what? strong in you. So if you think about it, this is Paul's last letter to Timothy. And one of the very first things that he says is, first of all, man, you know what, Timothy, I, I keep praying for you, man. I just want to let you know that I love you and I can't wait till we have the opportunity to see each other, whether in this world or in the next. But as I'm thinking about you, I'm thinking about your faith. And when I'm thinking about your faith, I'm thinking about where that faith first found its influence in you, which is through your, your grandmother, Lois. And now, as she passed that down to her own daughter, Eunice, and how her daughter passed that down to you, and through that influence, you have strength, strength of faith. In Acts, like I said earlier, we have a little bit of a glimpse of, of, of Timothy and, and of Paul's relationship with Timothy. And over in Acts chapter 16, Paul was on his second missionary journey, and he was coming to a place called Derby and Lystra. And so when he comes there, so Paul went first to Derby and then to Lystra. And so when he was at Lystra, 
you know, uh, there was a young disciple named Timothy. So this is about 15 years or so before uh, Paul wrote his letter to Timothy. So there had been about 15 years that went by with this relationship between Paul and Timothy when he writes 2 Timothy. So here in chapter 16, you're kind of getting a glimpse of how they first met, how that relationship was forged. And so it says here, you know, so Paul went there where there was this guy who was a young disciple. His name was Timothy. And his mother, we know her name, right? His mother, Eunice, was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. In other words, it's kind of in there to kind of help us to understand that a lot of the uniqueness of this faithful young man comes out of the uniqueness and faithfulness of his mom. One of the things I want to just really say to, to some of you ladies is that uh, and I want to kind of encourage you here, because some of y'all are here because you may be single moms, or you may be here uh, because you, you see the value of your relationship with Christ and your desire for, for Christ to influence the life of your kids. And you may be married, but you're doing it on your own. Okay? And sometimes you feel like, am I really making a difference? Am I really making an impact? So here you have, you know, Eunice who was a Jewish believer, but she was married to a Greek. In other words, he wasn't a believer. And so sometimes you can get really frustrated and thinking, man, I feel like I'm pulling this thing all by myself. And sometimes I feel like they're pulling me away and pulling the kids away. And there can feel a lot of this tension that goes on with, those, with the dynamic of that relationship. But somehow, some way, what we know is that Eunice continued to be faithful to the Lord and to love her son and to continue to speak the graciousness of God in his life. And so I want to encourage you, ladies, that this is a guy named Timothy. This is a guy who had a mom who influenced his life and a grandmother who influenced his life, who had a dad who wasn't really that much into, into Christ. But she kept loving her son, encouraging her son, and all of that. And think about it this way, ladies. 2,000 years later, in a country that Eunice doesn't even know existed, we're talking about her son. We're talking about her son. You never know what's going to happen. But there's a beautiful thing here that should hopefully inspire you, encourage you with, with Eunice, or if you're a grandmother, Lois, who maybe your adult kids, you know, really are kind of doing their own thing with life apart from Christ but you are still wanting to instill your life, your, your heart and your devotion to Christ into their life, please keep doing it. Keep doing it like a Lois. Moms, keep doing it like a Eunice, okay? Because your kids need you. Here's the thing, and this is why family is so important. You can invite somebody, you can invite a family member, aunt, uncle, and all that sort of stuff, and brother or sister to come to church, and, um, and if it's a message, you know, like say, say it's a message on like, whatever, finances. And you're like, oh no, they're talking about finances today. You know, your friend may not want to come back to church. They may be going through something very hard and difficult. And so they're coming to church looking for answers. And they're looking for this 30 minute spot to find all the answers to that particular issue, problem they're having. And we don't talk about it that day. And they walk away disappointed. That's why 30 minutes every Sunday is not enough. In fact, that's why it's not the most influential thing. It's family. Because if you invite a family member to church, when you walk out of here, guess what? You're still family. You still have that relationship with them. You can still pray for them. You can still love them. You can continue to, to um, you know, walk that journey with them and, and, and learn about their questions and maybe find the answers to them and help them out. But the thing is, is that you get to be part of their family until you are, you, you know, the Lord's called you away or God's called them away, but they're still part of your family. There's a longevity within family. I think about another single mom who would pray and pray and pray and, and just try to nag her adult son into the God's kingdom, and her son didn't want anything to do with it. He was just doing fine with himself and all that until God finally answered her prayer and got a hold of her son. And we named a city after him up the road from here called St. Augustine, St. Augustine. St. Augustine's 
mom would just pray and pray and pray and pray, and he'd become one of the most influential Christians of the last 2,000 years. So moms, grandmothers, dads, and grandfathers, aunts, uncles, don't give up on your family. As we saw earlier, you have huge influence in their lives. And so then Paul um, wanted him to join them on their journey, and so then there goes that relationship with those two guys. But I love the idea that, that Paul really understood you know, as he mentors um, Timothy. And as n- there's no doubt that Timothy was greatly influenced by the Apostle Paul. But Paul makes it very clear, hey, even though I've, be- you know, influenced you, I remember the great influence of your grandmother and your mother by which you have a strong faith in them. One of the things about me that I, I try to do in my life is I really try to watch how other people, you know, live their life in such a way that I want to learn how to um, love my family, live life well, follow Christ. And so when I see people do something very unique, I'll, I'll pay attention. I, I'm not usually a, lot of person that, a person that asks a lot of questions, but I do kind of watch. Back when we were in California and I was on staff at a church there, I met a guy that I began to kind of watch. And sometimes we built a relationship, so I started asking him some questions too. But I would just kind of watch him. His name was Terry Humphreys. And Terry had two kids with his wife, um, Chris. And, um, and he had a daughter. His name was Carrie. Her name was Carrie. And Carrie was going to college, and, but still lived um, around the house where they, they were at in Southern California. And, um, and she met this guy. And one thing you got to know about Terry is, is Terry loves Jesus Christ, loves him tremendously. He doesn't come from a pastor's background or anything like that. Uh, he went to the University of Ohio State. Uh, he swam, and he was an IT guy. But somewhere along the line, God got a hold of him, and he just really began to really love God. And through that, he loved, loved his wife well and loved his kids well. Well, anyways, he had the dilemma of thinking about his daughter, who's Mary, uh, who was dating a guy who didn't know the Lord, could care less about God, and he saw that this relationship was beginning to go towards marriage. And so what Terry Humphreys did was he, he went to her boyfriend, who was soon to be her fiance, and he saw the writing on the wall, and he, so he said to him, his name was Ronnie, he said, Ronnie, you know, I know you're looking for a place to live. Why don't you come and live? I have an upstairs garage apartment. Why don't you come and live with us rent-free? That's a brilliant dad. You know why he did that? It's influence. He started building a relationship with this young man. And through that, Ronnie began to feel that Terry was, not, you know, was a kind, wise man. And like a lot of young adults, we do, look for, we do like to have, you know, look for wise, older people to help, you know, to, to help us hash life you know, uh, with. And so through that, Terry basically led, what he did, he led Ronnie to a a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Ronnie and and Carrie, they, they ended up getting married, but in a very unique way. They got married, they won a contest back in 1989. They got married on a Rose Bowl float on New Year's Day in front of 350 million people watching on TV. And so there was a, there was a, I think a great uncle who uh, was a pastor. And so he came and did their wedding for them. So, hi, so, so, you know, fast forward, Carrie and Ronnie have two kids. They moved to Northern California and Terry and Chris decided they want to be close to their grandkids. And so they move as well. So you got to understand Ronnie grew up in a, in a, in a family that was you know, could care less about God. In fact, Ronnie's dad was a man of great, he was a pretty angry guy. He wasn't always the nicest man. But through that, you know, that relationship that Terry had with Ronnie, Ronnie's dad became a Christ follower and his life was changed. And then you began to see these two grandparents, co-grandparenting, as they would go to their grandkids' games together and they would do things together in order to have influence in the life of these kids. When we did our 15th anniversary at our church, somebody asked the question, they said, how many of you guys 
came to our church and, or gave your life to, to Jesus Christ because of Ronnie Sims. And I kid you not, probably about 150, 200 people raised their hands. And it all started by a dad who loved his wife, who began to learn how to love his unbelieving, soon-to-be fiance and son, to invest his life in them, by which through that gave his life to Christ, through that by which his, this young man's dad gave their life to Christ. Through that, he saw his life as an opportunity to go and share the love of Jesus Christ. Ronnie didn't become a pastor. He was just a local businessman. But because of his heart and his love for Jesus Christ, he just shared faith. That's the power of the an influence of an extended family that we have. Four questions I want to ask you as we kind of end our time here is with this. As you think about your ex extended family, all right, because we all have, more than likely, have some kind of sort of extended family. And if you don't have any family whatsoever, um, you know, and you feel the effects of never having a family, I don't know everybody's story in here. Some of your story may be the very get-go. You've been in foster care and, um, and all of that. And so your, your journey has been a very hard and painful one, especially when it comes up with family. I want you to stick with us because next week we're going to talk about the second most influential institution ever created by God, which is us, family. We're family, okay? And whether you have a family, if you don't have a biological family, you have a family. We're family, all right? We're going to talk about that next week, okay? But for those of us who have an extended family, a couple questions I want just to ask uh, for you just to ask. And I want you to ask of God. Number one, Lord, who in my family do you want me to pray for? Now you say, wait a minute, God wants me to pray for everybody in my family. Well, that's probably true. But here's the deal. I bet if you gave God some space and just asked him this question, he'll begin to put on your heart somebody within your extended family. And don't forget, you can say, well, I'm just an aunt and an uncle and this and all that, and they live all the other. We always just got to keep reminding ourselves. And I know it's easy because I fall in this trap. I don't do this all really well. So this is a great reminder for me is who in my life does God want me to, to pray and lean into and talk to him about in my extended family? Number two question, Lord, who in my family do you want me to reach out and connect with? Now, I'm not talking about reach out and connect and now you got to go seal the deal and make them a Christian and all that sort of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about just, you know, praying and saying, okay, God, you want me to call them? You want me to email them? You want me to connect with them? And just, just connecting, just say, hey, you know what? I feel like God's just laid in my heart just to, you know, you know my heart. And so I just want to call and see how you're doing. You're doing all right? We haven't talked in a while. What's been going on with you? The third uh, question I want you to ask, which is a really great question. This is a question I ask people when they go and visit. You know, they go, they go visit family and Thanksgiving. Hey, we're going to Tennessee to go visit my aunts and uncles and family. They're all going to be there. Or, or hey, I'm going to go visit my, my mom in North Carolina or wherever. I always ask them the question when they go visit their family members. I always ask this question. So is this a vacation or is this ministry, right? You know you have some people in your family, right? where when you go visit them, you're like, oh, good, this is so good. It's going to be such a wonderful visit. And then there's some of that you, you go visit, and you're kind of like, all right, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. All right. It's, it's, all right. You know, and sometimes what I want you to do is encourage you to kind of flip. Instead of like, oh, this is going to be horrible, blah, 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 before you even get there, and just go, okay, wait a minute, God. But God demonstrates his own love for me that while I was still a sinner, he, he gave his life up for me. That even though my family may have some baggage and all that, and they have some hurts and hangups and all that sort of stuff that comes directly towards me sometimes, while they are still sinners, maybe I can go and show some love and spend this time to say, how do you want me to minister to them, Lord? And so God, I'm gonna give you this time as I go and spend with them. And it's okay, you may get in back in the car like I've done or, you know, or I've known people to do. They get back in their car and they go, <laughs> I'm so glad we're going home. Ministry's over. It's time for a Sabbath. But I guarantee you, the more that you do that, you'll begin to recognize that you do have influence in the lives of your family and of your aunts and uncles and nephews and all of that. If you flipped it around and just said, okay, God, this time that you have with me with them, I no longer need to be influenced by them because you are my father. You're my family. I'm influenced by you. 
And so as you're influencing me, I want to go and share your influence with them. Now, this it can be a very hard and difficult question. Guy, Tyler, you don't understand. You don't know what, you know, what my family's like and how hard it is. Uh, I, you know, I bet it's really, really hard. Some people can be really mean. And because family is so influential, that meanness can really cut even deeper within our own hearts, right? Can it? It can. So this is why there's that last question, and this is it. Lord, who in my church family do I need to ask to go on this journey with me? Who is it that I need to begin to ask, say, hey, you know what? God's been stirring my heart to, to rekindle this relationship, to rebuild this relationship, or at least to say I'm sorry, or whatever, whatever God's doing that you know is hard. Lord, who is it in my church family that I can just reach out to and just say, hey, you know what? This is where God's laying on my heart. But man, because they're family and they have such great influence in me, my head begins to spin. I just need somebody in my life to keep me grounded in the love of Jesus Christ and keep me grounded in knowing that I'm loved by God. Will you walk with me? So what we're going to do is our, the worship team's going to come out and they're going to they're going to come and, and sing a song and we're going to sing together that reminds us of the beautiful hope that we have in our Lord. That through Jesus Christ, because of his love for us, we can break the chains of the hurt and pain that we've had and, and accumulated because of our family. That we can now live for a new family. But also through that, let's celebrate that, but also through that, I want you to begin to pray, God, who in my family are still wearing chains? They're still trying to deal with a lot of hard stuff apart from you. How can I just begin to pray for them? How can I begin this journey to have a conversation with them or do life with them or connect with them? Whatever it is that God's doing through that. And then we'll come and we'll, we'll take communion together. Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for your, your grace in my life. You put me in a family that is imperfect. And yeah, there are some things that have been hard things in, in my own life that I know I've had to deal with um, in that realm. And I thank you so much that you continue to do all that healing in my life. But God, I also confess that, uh, you know, um, I haven't been perfect either. Not only in my own, you know, kid's life, but also in my extended family life. I get busy, I get distracted. I think about, you know, my busyness and about me. And it's easy for me to forget about those people. Mom, dad, siblings, aunts, uncles, nieces, and nephews. All of them, Lord. And so, Father, I just thank you that you give us the opportunity and space to, re to reflect on that and remember that. And so, God, as we, as we sing this song and we celebrate the hope that we have in you, who is it that we need to give that same hope to in our own family? It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.